Hey everyone, time for another video. Back in the third quarter of 2009, Intel released the Pentium E6500K, a multiplier unlocked version of the Pentium E6500, exclusive to China, which I discovered after watching the video that Random Gaming in HD made for his channel a while ago. The E6500K is a 65W TDP dual core processor with no hyper threading for the LG 775 socket clocked at 2.93GHz with a 1066 MHz frontside bus. It features an unlocked core multiplier, allowing for easy overclocking simply by increasing the multiplier from within the BIOS, which also has the advantage of not having to overclock the RAM as well. It is based on the Wolftail 3M architecture and features 228 million transistors built on the 45 nanometer fabrication process. And unlike the Core 2 Duo E7000 series, which is also based on the Wolftail 3M architecture, the E6500K has 1 megabyte of its 3 megabytes of L2 cache disabled, giving it 2 megabytes in total. I'm unsure of the original price when it was released in China, but from what I can find out online, the equivalent US price would have been roughly $102, or $119.81 today, adjusting for inflation, which is roughly £93.82, or €105.26. But I managed to buy it for around £11.66 on eBay UK, which is roughly $14.90, or €13.10. Today I'll be testing the E6500K in Cinebench R15, and a few games as well, which are GTA V, Counter Strike Global Offensive, Fortnite, and a personal favourite of mine, Warframe, all of which will be run at both 1080p and 720p at stock speeds and with an overclock. The rest of the system we'll be using today features 8GB of DDR2 RAM at 800MHz, a MSI GTX 1080 Armor OC edition for my personal system to eliminate any bottlenecking, Windows 10 Pro 64-bit, and the Fantex TC14PE to keep the CPU cool. First up today, it's Cinebench R15, a benchmarking application popular among extreme overclockers, designed to test your processor's multi-threaded performance by rendering a photorealistic 3D scene. I'll be running the E6500K at its stock 2.93GHz and with an overclock of 3.92GHz, the maximum I could get stable with a safe voltage. At stock, the E6500K managed a score of 149, which is only 3 points ahead of the 2.8GHz Core 2 Duo E7400 I tested a few videos back, and with a 3.92GHz overclock, which required a multiplier increase to 14 and a frontside bus speed of 1120MHz, with a maximum voltage of around 1.42 to 1.44V, the E6500K managed a score of 193, an identical score to what the E7400 did with a 3.65GHz overclock. First up for our games today is Grand Theft Auto V. Released in 2013, Grand Theft Auto V finally had its much anticipated PC release in April of 2015, and is set in the fictional state of San Andreas, which is based on Southern California. At 1080p on the lowest settings with sharp shadows, the game is pretty much unplayable. In the city, the FPS never really got above 30 and micro stuttered throughout, and constantly dipped underneath 20 frames per second, with pretty severe stutter at points as well, making for some extremely jarring gameplay. An issue I also noticed was that in moments of intense stutter, the inputs also locked up as well, leading you to crash vehicles if you were attempting to turn the corner when it happened. I managed to get a 15 minute fraps benchmark, which showed an average of 32 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 15 and 12 frames per second respectively. And as you can see from the frame time graph on screen now, the frame times often approach 1 tenth of a second, which represents a micro stutter throughout the whole game. At 720p on the lowest settings with sharp shadows, there was pretty much no improvement at all, and on occasion, it actually performed worse. The stutter going through the city was the same as at 1080p, but with slightly higher FPS in the mid-20s to high 30s. Not that that matters. Heading out to the desert, the micro stutter unfortunately remained, and with how low the FPS was, it would probably cause some severe eye strain as well if you looked at it for too long. A 15 minute fraps benchmark showed an average of 32 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 15 and 11 frames per second respectively. And according to the frame time graph, on one occasion the game stuttered for over 3 tenths of a second, and there were several other occasions of stutter for close to or over 1 tenth of a second. Next up for our games today is Counter Strike Global Offensive, or CSGO as it's more commonly known. I'll be testing the game in a match with hard difficulty bots on the Mirage map, as given my skill or lack thereof in this game, I'd rather not just film myself getting completely slaughtered. At 1080p with the lowest settings, the game is mostly playable despite having occasional issues with stutter, including some stutter when turning the camera. For the most part though, the FPS tended to stay within the 30 to high 60s FPS range, and as mentioned the game did occasionally stutter, which wasn't really an issue in my test, but may have an effect on gameplay if you play online. 
A 15 minute fraps benchmark showed an average of 63 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 33 and 23 frames per second respectively. Moving to 720p didn't really improve FPS figures at all, but did manage to fix the biggest stutters that 1080p experienced. FPS was still in the 30s to high 60 FPS range, and stutter when turning the camera still happened occasionally too. Overall though, the game is enjoyable, but like 1080p, the occasional stutter and stutter when turning the camera may have an effect on online gameplay. A 15 minute fraps benchmark showed near identical results to 1080p, with an average of 62 frames per second, and 1% and 0.1% lows of 34 and 23 frames per second respectively. And looking at the frame time graph on screen now, it does show that there was indeed slightly less stutter than at 1080p, but the worst of it was still over 2 tenths of a second. Moving on to our next game, it's Fortnite Battle Royale, the free to play and still massively popular title from Epic Games. Technical still in early access, it is a game in which you can compete against up to 99 other players in a battle to the death, with the last man or woman standing declared a winner. You can also play in teams as well. For the test today I'll be running the game in both 1080p and 720p with low settings, however I've set the view distance to epic. 1080p, the 6500k unfortunately didn't fare that well. FPS in the pre-match holding area sat between the mid-20s up to the 40s depending on the area of the map you were in. There was also some pretty severe stutter here as well, but that shouldn't matter too much considering the match hasn't started yet. Moving on to the battle bus, and the FPS was actually ok, with figures ranging from around 60 to over 100 FPS, but when diving though there was unfortunately a lot of micro stutter, and the FPS dipped underneath 30 on some occasions depending on the amount of players around you. Once on the ground though, the game was a lot more playable, with FPS tending to stay over 60 and hitting the 80s at points, but did suffer from occasional micro stutter. A 15 minute fraps benchmark showed an average of 60 frames per second, which was inflated by the time spent in the loading screens between rounds, and 1% and 0.1% lows of 21 and 12 frames per second respectively. Looking at the frame time graph shows, the game stuttered for over a second on 6 different occasions which will definitely have an effect on gameplay if you are playing competitively rather than for fun. Moving on to 720p, and much like the previous two games, performance was near identical, and on occasion the stutter was actually a bit worse. The pre-match holding area saw FPS figures hitting the low 40s but with some pretty severe stutter, and the FPS dips below 20 making for a horrible experience. Once the battle bus got going though, FPS managed to stay between the 60 to 80 frames per second range depending on the camera angle, but when diving FPS dropped to around the mid 30s with some dips underneath that as well. Things were mostly ok when on the ground though, with the FPS around 60, but there was some micro stutter and dips into the 30s which could be pretty jarring if you're more sensitive to FPS changes. As mentioned, performance was pretty much the same as at 1080p, which the Fraps benchmark shows, with an average of 61 frames per second, again inflated by the loading screen, and 1% and 0.1% lows of 21 and 11 frames per second respectively. The frame time graph on screen now shows how bad the stutter got at points, with frame times of over 2 seconds at times, which probably would have a massive effect on gameplay if you're playing competitively. The final game before we move on to overclocking is probably one of my favourites right now, Warframe which is free to play and can be downloaded from the Warframe website or through Steam. I managed to get a fairly decent frame rate using the medium preset with depth of field and motion blur disabled, and to test that I played through a survival mission on Saturn. For pretty much the entirety of the test, FPS stayed somewhere between 60 to over 80 frames per second depending on the location of the map you were in, and other than some highly intense scenes where FPS dropped to the high 30s, it didn't really go below 60 at all. There was some stutter though which you'll see in the frame time graph, but this fortunately didn't interfere that much at all, and overall it was a really enjoyable experience. A 15 minute fraps benchmark showed an average of 62 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 33 and 25 frames per second respectively. And given that the performance here was fairly decent, and the reduction in settings being all that is needed if you'd like better FPS, I didn't bore testing 720p. When it got round to overclocking, as mentioned previously, the 3.92GHz overclock in Cinebench required a multiplier of 14, with a frontside bus speed of 1120MHz, and a voltage of around 1.42 to 1.44V. This unfortunately wasn't stable in the games I tested, but I did manage to get 3.85GHz stable, which used the same settings as the Cinebench overclock but with a decrease in frontside bus speed to 1100MHz, up from the stock speed of 1066 at 1080p, the overclock helped a little bit in Grand Theft Auto V, but unfortunately couldn't make it playable. 
Throughout the city, FPS had increased to around the low to high 30s, but still exhibited a lot of micro star with dips underneath the 30 frames per second mark. Throughout the rest of the game, it was often a really jarring experience and quite uncomfortable to play, and you would probably struggle to actually see what was going on due to how low the FPS was at times. A 15 minute fraps benchmark showed an average of 36 frames per second, but with 1% and 0.1% lows of 18 and 13 frames per second respectively and the frame time graph on screen now shows that there were a few stutters of over 2 tenths of a second and several more close to 1 tenth. 720p again performed pretty much identical to 1080p, with only a 1 frames per second difference in average frame rates. FPS in the city was in the low 30s to low 40s, with dips into the high 20s, and much like 1080p, the game stuttered pretty badly occasionally, making the game completely unplayable and a genuinely uncomfortable experience at times. As mentioned, the benchmark showed performance was near identical to 1080p, average frame rates of 37 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 18 and 13 frames per second respectively. Looking at the frame time graph shows that the stutter was just as bad if not a little bit worse than 1080p. Moving on to CSGO, and the performance was actually really good. The overclock pretty much eliminated any and all stutter that the stock speed exhibited, with FPS throughout the bottom match sitting in the 60s to mid 80s range, with only occasional dips into the 50s, and depending on the location of the map you were in, FPS sometimes creeped up to 100 frames per second. There's not really much else to say about the performance here, other than that a 15 minute fraps benchmark showed an average of 79 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 46 and 35 frames per second respectively. The frame time graph does show some stutters however of around 80 milliseconds, but throughout the test there was no noticeable stutter at all. And given the performance at 1080p, there wasn't really much point in testing 720p, but I went ahead and did it anyway. FPS here was around the 70 to over 90 frames per second mark, but dipped underneath 50 frames per second at points. The game ran reasonably smooth, but there was some stutter throughout the game. And a 15 minute fraps benchmark showed an average of 79 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 44 and 32 frames per second respectively. And as you can see from the frame time graph, there was more significant stutter than the 1080p with several gaps in frame times of over one tenth of a second. Moving on to Fortnite, and at 1080p, performance did improve a little bit. However, in the pre-match holding area, FPS was again in the mid-twenties to the forties, with a lot of stutter depending on the area of the map you were in. On the battle bus though, the FPS did manage to get between 90 to 100 frames per second, and was reasonably smooth, but did dip into the forties once people started diving out. I also noticed some stutter here as well, with the FPS dipping below 20 frames per second at times. Once on the ground though, FPS reached over 90 frames per second at points and was generally a lot smoother than at stock. However, there were a number of occasions where the game stuttered quite noticeably, with FPS dipping into the 30s. A 15 minute fraps benchmark showed an average of 67 frames per second, which was again inflated by the time spent in the loading screens, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 22 and 12 frames per second respectively. Looking at the frame time graph on screen now shows that on some occasions there were gaps of over 1 second between frames and several others of 2 to 3 tenths of a second. However, you could probably put up with the star if you just fancy some fun rather than competitive gameplay. 720p was kind of a mixed bag in terms of results, in that the FPS was lower at points of the map than 1080p, but exhibited less stutter overall. FPS in the pre-match holding area was around the high 20s to the low 50s, but did stutter pretty badly, and on occasion FPS dipped underneath 20. On the battle bus, FPS was in the high 40s all the way into the 90s depending on the camera angle, and dipped down to the high 20s when you start diving. There was also still some micro stutter here as well. Once on the ground though, FPS sat between 50 to over 90 frames per second and ran relatively smooth considering the stutter at stock. A 15 minute fraps benchmark showed an average of 66 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 24 and 14 frames per second respectively. The frame time graph on screen now showed that there were several occasions of stutter lasting over one tenth of a second. Before frame, the overclock made a notable difference. FPS for the most part stayed between 60 to 100 frames per second, and other than a few occasions where the FPS dipped to the high 40s, the FPS didn't really drop below 60 at all. Again, I'm not going to test 720p as the performance here is pretty decent with a reduction in settings being all that is needed to increase the frame rate even more. A 15 minute fraps benchmark showed an average of 64 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 38 and 31 frames per second respectively, showing that overall the game is more than playable on the 6500k. There was however one occasion where there was a gap of over 2 tenths of a second between frames according to the frame time graph on screen now, but that however didn't affect the gameplay at all. Overall, I was kind of disappointed that I couldn't get 4GHz stable, but a near 1GHz overclock over the stock speed is still pretty decent. 
Saying that though, I've gotten better overclocks with other processors simply by increasing the front side bus. So although it is a nice feature, the unlocked multiplier doesn't really make much of a difference. And even at 3.85GHz, it performs pretty much the same as the E7400 I tested a while ago, which was only running 3.675GHz. Saying that though, it was still pretty interesting to test the E6500K, considering that it is a rare processor, with it only being released exclusively to the Chinese market. If you liked this video, please consider liking it and sharing it, and leaving a comment as well. You can also subscribe to my channel if you'd like to see more content like this. Hopefully you'll tune in for the next one.